Becky Nolan with AFC International. Thank you for being here this afternoon, but also thank you for being here all week long. Um, I'm particularly honored to be able to introduce uh, the panel this afternoon, which of course is cyber warfare. How do we provide assured communications to the warfighter? And we couldn't think of anyone uh, more appropriate to head up this panel than Lieutenant General retired uh, Jeff Sorensen, a recently, recently retired from the Army. Um, General Sorensen was in the Army for 37 years, uh, over 20 of which uh, as an acquisition guru. So uh, there again, uh, I know there's a challenge out there with the acquisition process, and I think we've got an expert here who can, who can help with that. But I, in particular, as I, was, as I was reading through his past accomplishments, um, was, was struck by the, uh, his, his uh, concern for efficiency, cost efficiency, for maximizing the resources which, of the Army and our nation in, in general, and, and certainly at this time, that's, that's the important thing. So his last job was the Army uh, G6, the, the CIO for the Army, and during that time, he led the transformation of the network uh, through an enterprise approach to information systems, technology, and management, expanding capabilities for the warfighter um, as, as that was happening, as he, as he pulled the resources together. He has consistently uh, been, a, been a great uh, participant in the AFCIA forum, uh, has used the AFCIA as a resource, the kind of resource that, that we like to think that we are, and that is in bringing industry and government together to be able to talk about the requirements and the capabilities. And two examples in particular, sir, that, that uh, you've done with us, uh, the Land Warnet Conference, which is um, the, the big Army conference, which we are proud to be a partner with the Army um, that happens in Tampa in the summertime, and uh, General Sorensen really took that conference and brought um, an amalgam of, of all of the smaller Army conferences into one so that people could take advantage of, of the great program that, that is put together there for professional development and technical education and the ability, again, to talk to industry. And the other was at that conference, we, we often have trouble um, or challenges with, with, with the military supporters in terms of bringing industry in. And, and General Sorensen said, we will have an industry panel. And it's not just going to be an industry panel where, where we put up there four or five industry folks and they talk about uh, whatever they want to talk about, but instead he really got involved, engaged with them, and said, these are the things that, that, the, Army, um, that the Army IT group needs to understand, needs to solve. And I want people on the panel who can talk about those things. And so we're having that, we're having that same idea today as he talks about, um, as he and his panel, which he will introduce, uh, we'll talk about all of that. So I would say you went direct from a partnership with AFCIA from the military side and now, now still being a partner to AFCIA on the civilian side. And we are proud to have you. This is a, please join me in welcoming General Sorensen, a true patriot and a great friend. Well, thank you. How are you doing today? I've learned to tie a tie. Actually, I think uh, it took me a while practicing just to make sure it would rest on the top of my belt buckle. But you know, after about six tries, you finally got it done right. Um, so we've, we've put together, if you will, a panel to talk about this thing called cyber. And I'm not going to wax eloquently on my personal observations of that, other than to say, in many cases, that like a lot of things, People throw out the word cyber, and depending upon what side of the fence or where you're coming from in terms of your, your experience, your organization, your education, that one word cyber means a multitude of different definitions. For somebody in the signal regiment, cyber means operational networks. If you're someone in the military intelligence field, you're looking at trying to exploit what's taking place on that network to find out some, if you will, seems that you can go and provide some attack vectors to attack. And so it's offense and defense. And we have a panel today that's going to talk, in many cases, about all that. OK? But they're not going to essentially use that one word, cyber, just for meaning one thing. So the first one you're going to hear from today is Colonel Joe, Jimmy, General Joe Brendler. Uh, when I first met Joe, he was a colonel, but now he is a general. He's assigned to DISA. He's been there since July 2009. He's a signal officer. And he is uh, working at DISA, where he coordinates the efforts of a 6,600-member organization and a management team of about a $6 billion-plus budget 
directing efforts to provide effective global command and control and combat support systems for the President, the Secretary of Defense, combatant commanders, joint staff, military departments, and co combat service agencies. Next, we have Rear Admiral Ned Dietz. He has been the commander of the Naval Network Warfare Command since May 2010. In his capacity, he is responsible for providing that type of service, i.e. network capability, to 750,000 users and ensuring the operation and security of the Naval Global C4 Network. Next, we're going to have Colonel Tim Hill, who is the Director of the Army Intelligence and Security Command Directorate for the Futures. He is a military intelligence officer and has been assigned to INSCOM since 2006. In his current capacity as the Futures Directorate leader, he is responsible for directing an office of about 150 people that in many cases does advanced intelligence integration of applications that provide state-of-the-art intelligence fusion capabilities for the Army. And last but not least, unfortunately, we did have Eric Cole, who has written in some cases books like Hacker Beware. Unfortunately, he had a particular issue with uh, transportation. So Vice Admiral Nancy Brown retired, uh, has elected to come in, and so she's going to draft it here about, I think it was, what, 30 minutes ago, Nancy? Just kind of walking around, you, you, you come over here. Uh, Right. And you know, how <laughs> you know how persuasive Becky can be. Um, so in any case, uh, she completed a 36-year career, successful career culminating in her last job as the Joint Staff J6, where she was responsible to the Chairman of the Joint Staff on all matters relating to C4 requirements, strategy, and alignment. And as I said before, unfortunately, Eric Cole couldn't be here. He's written books, but if you want to ask a question, ask Nancy Brown what the last book she was that she read or wrote. Okay, with that, I'm going to start with Joe, and uh, we'll kind of get this started. The way this is going to go, so you can think about it, I've asked him to come in and do a sort of a 10-minute pitch. They're going to all go through their particular presentations in terms of their perspectives, not only speaking from the global perspective in terms of DISA, getting to a service responsibility in terms of Navy, talking about the intel piece that Tim's going to talk about, and then Nancy is going to talk a little bit from an industry perspective. After that, we're going to go through a series of questions. I've already given the panel, if you will, a few questions to kind of get the uh, juices flowing, uh, trying to limit their answers in many cases to a couple of minutes. So I'd ask you to think about the questions, because this is more about what you want to ask from them, as opposed to kind of what uh, we're going to talk about just specifically that we'd like to talk about. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. All right, thanks, sir. I want to start by saying thank you to you and to AFSIA for the opportunity to be here. I'm honored to get to be part of this panel. Um, I appreciate your comments uh, that many times when people talk about cyber, they're, they're talking about different things. Uh, and I do intend to start my comments with a brief discussion of context. Uh, the question that um, you see in the, um, in, in the flyers for this particular panel, uh, how do we provide assured communications to the warfighter is a, it's a how question, so ultimately we need to get to the how answers. Uh, but I think it's also relevant to take a look at the why uh, in order to understand the context, because the why we have to do something is often uh, what dictates the how we need to do it, because it determines the features of the things which uh, constitute the how we end up uh, providing the solutions to the problems presented by the question at hand. So I want to start, um, and I know we, we don't have visuals in here, so I'm going to ask you to use your imaginations and try to follow along with me as I paint a picture for you of, uh, of cyberspace. Uh, cyberspace is big, and it's all man-made. So picture, and you can close your eyes if you need to follow with the visual on this, but since I know we just had lunch, I would ask you not to get too comfortable with your eyes closed. Um, picture on the, on the wall behind me a big black screen. It almost looks like a summer night sky with stars on it, except that in between all those billions of stars are little lines connecting all the dots. You've probably seen this in various textbooks or magazine articles uh, or other places before as a representation of a map of the internet. Uh, I think it serves as a pretty good visual with which to think about cyberspace and understand that it's very big. 
Uh, but what I ask you to consider is that given that it's entirely man-made, every single dot and every interconnecting line on that map uh, represents an investment and an operating cost that someone chooses to bear because it represents a perceived greater gain than the cost they have to bear in order to uh, get what they get out of it. Uh, in our case, as part of the Department of Defense, what we get out of it is enabled collective security as provided by the Department of Defense. In other cases, it's education or entertainment, uh, social metamorphosis, and so on. But given that um, it, is, it is this gain, uh, enablement of the collective defense, which is achieved by the costs DOD must bear in order to have a part of cyberspace that is built by it and available to it. Um, it's, uh, I ask you just take that as, as the context. Uh, it's important. It's our collective security. Uh, it is achieved by providing a enterprise infrastructure, uh, a global information grid, or other common uh, current terminology is enterprise information environment uh, that is always on and secure. So as we start looking now at the how do we provide assured comms to the warfighter, look at this as it's not just how we provide assured comms, it's actually how are we assuring the missions the warfighters are trying to accomplish in the various portions of the global commons that General Odierno was talking about at lunch, cyber being one of those. But across all of those uh, component parts of the global commons, uh, you hear people talking about things like everything is networked. And uh, in order to defeat a terrorist organization, I want my organization to be a better network. Uh, the author of that comment um, was uh, General McChrystal, uh, and accompanying those words were his explanation that what he was talking about was a network of people in the human dimension, but in order to achieve that, they needed an infrastructure. Now that infrastructure could be tin cans and strings, but you have to be able to get information from one person to another in a network in order to have that. You have to have infrastructure. So we assure the warfighters' missions by having an infrastructure for them that is always on and secure. And I know that folks further down the table from me are going to get into areas of their expertise where uh, you'll hear a lot more about some of the high-speed things that we do on the uh, uh, security side and active defense. So let me take a, just a minute to talk about the always on uh, component of that. That's a form of assurance. It's availability. It is freedom of maneuver uh, in cyberspace, so to speak, uh, that we achieve by having the right amount and the right balance of diversity and capacity, both in connectivity and in computing. So in, in DISA, uh, just as a, a couple of numerical examples, over the last five years, in order to address the diversity and capacity and connectivity uh, topic, we've taken the uh, aggregate bandwidth of the Defense Information Systems Network, the DISN, from 430 gigabytes in 2005 to 7862 in 2010, a two-fold order of magnitude increase over a five-year period. Uh, that's mostly fiber, but we've also experienced a, uh, an increase in the use of commercial SATCOM, uh, which is in part available through contract vehicles for which DISA is, is now responsible as a, a procurement agent. Um, that increase has gone up over that same period by a factor of five. Uh, bottom line on this, 
no single point of failure. It's pretty much common sense to anybody who's been running the networks that you design your network so you have no single points of failure because if anything is a universal truth in, in my business, over 26 years of service in the Army, it's things break or they get broken uh, and sometimes the causes are not antagonistic enemies but well-meaning soldiers who are moving too fast and trying to, trying to work really hard, but it's guaranteed fact things will stop functioning and if you've got a single point of failure then you can experience an operational impact from something stopping working and this is what we seek to avoid by continuously managing the right balance of diversity and capacity. Now we can extend the same line of thinking into computing and in the agency we do this with um, uh, a number of defense enterprise computing centers which are geographically distributed, so there's a geographic element of diversity right there. Uh, but we also have built into each one of those facilities a state-of-the-art uh, level of um, reliability in power and air conditioning. Uh, and uh, even with that, we recognize that this does not bring the residual risk of a failure down all the way to zero. So where you've got an application online in one place, there's also an application online in cold standby in another place, so that for continuity of operations, if you experience a problem with things running out of this location, you can switch over quickly to run them out of another location. But that's where we've been. Where we're headed with this technology, um, or, or with this capability is a better application portability achieved by increased use of technologies like virtualization where not just servers are virtualized but also desktops and storage uh, and that we use the virtualization in order to make it possible to have an application not just on in one place and cold standby someplace else but active in multiple locations simultaneously with the user load load balanced across them in this way if you have a failure in one location users are automatically load balanced over to other locations, zero operational impact from an outage in one location, no single point of failure. So that gets at the always on a little bit. To talk about the secure, um, this is an area where historically DISA has talked about defense in depth. Uh, and we've achieved some, some pretty good results in that over the last several years, the creation of the DOD um, demilitarized zone, a DMZ, uh, has reduced the attack surface, the attackable surface of DOD computing assets that are exposed to unsolicited connections from the internet by 90%. So that alone was a huge thing. But we've also brought online a capability to do web content filtering. Uh, at multiple levels throughout the defense in depth, at the uh, service level, at the enclave level, we have firewalls. We've also uh, got a, um, suites of um, monitoring equipment uh, uh, that um, are part of a larger architecture. And we've got, of course, um, most people have heard of the host base security system. This is also responsible for the antivirus program for DOD, so right down to the actual host app uh, platform level. Um, we also are working on developing our ability to conduct continuous monitoring of security configurations on network devices. This includes uh, automated uh, platforms as well as networking equipment. Uh, this, is, this would be a significant capability when we get to that. Um, and I suspect that guys down the table will talk about active, active defense and some of the things enabling to that. Um, I want to talk real briefly before wrapping up about an additional aspect of security that I think brings simultaneously a high utility. Uh, and that is uh, an extension of the success we've achieved with the DOD public key infrastructure, which has enabled us to get a start on eliminating anonymity from our networks, which is kind of like an identification of friend or foe on our networks. Uh, and to go beyond that, to make it possible for a user to go anywhere, 
present credentials, and be granted by a global decision-making engine access to the information they need to have. What we can do today, due to the implementation of a program recently uh, developed by DISA and fielded by the services and agencies uh, called DOD Visitor, is you can go to another DOD site where this uh, uh, software has been deployed by the services, plug in your CAC, the first time you plug it in, if you don't have an account there, it gives you an error message. The second time you plug it in, if you don't have an account there, one is automatically provisioned for you. You're given access to a browser uh, and basic uh, functions on, on the machine. So if um, you're, for example, a Marine deployed to an Army base in Afghanistan, uh, and the next day you've got to go to another location where you're going to be hosted for several weeks by the Air Force, you don't previously have an account there, plug your CAT card into a DOD computing asset, an account's automatically provisioned for you, and you get access to a browser. If you hear that your, your buddies have um, an evaluation report that you've got to do a digital signature on, as long as that's available on an enterprise application such as the Army's AKO, which has um, forms that can be digitally signed available globally, you can do that kind of work. So go anywhere and be productive is a current capability, but where we would like to take this is into attribute-based access control, whereby not only when you put your CAC card in a machine and present credentials are you able to authenticate globally with the Defense Manpower Data Center, which is the um, authoritative source for persona on the, on the network, but you can uh, retrieve from a global repository the attributes associated with your persona, present those to a global decision-making engine which can say, yes, you have a need to know the information you're requesting to receive, and you can receive that uh, on demand. Um, that's probably a couple more minutes longer than I was uh, supposed to run, sir, but... Uh, it's okay, Nancy Brown. She was giving you some time. All right. I've ceded my minutes to the <laughs> thanks, gentleman sir. from DISA. Okay, Ned. All right, sir, thanks. Uh, thanks again for the invitation to be here, and I'm really glad you started because it reminds me every day how much, how good my job is. Here sounds hard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'm struck by the fact that I'm bracketed by two Army guys. That's probably a smart thing. Uh, it also highlights the fact that this is a very, very joint uh, mission area and joint domain, perhaps more joint than anything else we do in the Department of Defense in the future. Uh, I also started my career with the Army in Hawaii and subsequently in, uh, in Korea and was uh, struck, by the, uh, struck by the fact that we had a, uh, a similar approach to things. A, it was get the job done, and B, it was get the job done. Um, I was also struck by the fact that jointness is a good thing. We all have our niche. When I first got there to Korea, I met a very young soldier who was involved in, uh, in the large exercise that used to occur there in February. And by tradition in the Navy, when you check into a new command, you put on your service dress blues and check aboard. I was standing in the passageway when he came running in from outside. It was about 20 below zero. And he was head to toe covered in frozen mud, uh, M16 slung and his load bearing equipment on. And he passed me in the passageway and he said, Navy, huh? And I said, yeah. He said, boy, sir, you couldn't pay me to get on a ship. And I said, perfect. We've all got our niche and, and I'm really glad you like living in a foxhole in 20 degree below weather. This is a challenging domain and I was struck by one thing. You talked about the domain. Uh, the only thing that I would add to that picture of blackness you described with the points of light would be it's also a very dangerous place where good guys and bad guys operate side by side and it's very, very difficult to distinguish the two. Um, when I talk about this, I, I think about this in the context of, of what the Navy has done over about the past uh, past four years and uh, the vision and, and path that the Chief of Naval Operations has taken, taken us down. Uh, the CNO sees this as a warfighting domain and a warfare area. Uh, in, a, uh, in a quote from a couple of years ago, he said, if we don't get the information, the network, and the intelligence piece of this right, we run the risk of sub-optimizing our platforms. We are a platform-centric Navy, uh, ships, submarines, and airplanes. Uh, but his statement was, uh, was sea change. The thought that if 
the network piece of this is not operating correctly, nothing else is either. He identified the ubiquitousness of this capability, uh, the dependence that we all have on it. That's not something that we should be sorry about. It, it is simply where we are uh, and we need it. And so as the CNO began to consider that fact in that context, he thought hard about how we should organize the Navy to fight within this domain. And he applied a recognizable model to that, which was the establishment of 10th Fleet and Fleet Cyber Command, the Navy's component to US Cyber Command. So it's very helpful within a service culture to see things that you recognize. And when you stand up a new warfare area in a new warfighting domain, it helps if everybody else in the organization can say, ah, numbered fleet. I know what that's for. I understand warfighting capability today. So that was critically important as we began to move forward. And of course, the stand-up of those organizations occurred in, uh, in January of 2010. Uh, there are a number of challenges here, and, and so I bend them into roughly four categories. Uh, the first one is battle space. It's rapidly changing. So uh, technology drives it. We talk a lot about Moore's Law, uh, but the people side of it drives it as well. Uh, I say it's more than Moore's Law. The technical piece, the capability piece is something that, that we all understand. But when you think about the human side of this and how rapidly it drives changes to the way we operate within this domain, it's critically important. And, and I think about the innovation piece. Uh, as, as we look at this battle space and we think about how we're going to dominate it in the future, we have to realize that it's more than networks. So as the Navy looked at the mission areas within 10th Fleet and Fleet Cybercom, it's everything information related. It's full spectrum, so it's spectrum dominance. It's IP-based networks, but it's also RF and long-haul communications. It's electronic warfare, both passive and active. It's information operations, and particularly computer network operations. Uh, it's a very complex networking environment. In the Navy, I have roughly 750,000 users. I have NMCI, now the Continuity of Services contract, that puts about 50% of my users on a single enterprise network, which means when I have a patch to push, I can hit one button and get it to about 50% of the users. And then I can spend about six months in touch labor trying to get it to the rest of the service. That's one of the challenges. We're a very distributed force with uh, roughly 300 chips worldwide uh, running on different networks with different capabilities. Uh, System diversity, we run everything from Windows NT to XP. There's a challenge just in that, both from the operational side and from the vulnerability side. And on the security side, we tend to see common problems across all of our users and networks. And I'll talk about how we categorize those problems in a minute. We're exposed. Uh, we're, uh, we're growing in our web access by about 39% per year. Nominally, it's like a pay raise. You just grow into it and wonder what, it, what you ever did without it. That's a data point. Uh, we can reduce our exposure by locking down the network, but we do a number of negative things. A, we don't have the network available to us to operate in, but B, we also restrict the utilization of that network by the younger members of our force who are out there innovating on it and figuring out how to take it to the next level. So a number of years ago, my wife retired. Uh, she called me from home and she said, hey, you know, now that I've got to take care of the 12-year-old and 14-year-old on a full-time basis, it's time for cell phones. I've got to be able to contact them. And I said, hun, they're too young. She said, okay, it's time for cell phones. So we went out and bought cell phones. <laughs> I bought more minutes than we could use in a year, and at the end of the first month, I had a $490 texting bill. I understood texting, and I used texting regularly myself, but what I hadn't realized was that it had completely supplanted voice communications in the demographic from about 12 to 25 years old. And that had all happened in a period of six to 12 months. That's where young people are going with this capability. We restrict their access to it. We won't take it to the next level, and we have to be able to take it to the next level. Uh, top 20 websites visited by, uh, by our users run the gamut from uh, Google High Bandwidth to, uh, to USAA. Uh, it's a data point. And by the way, if I look at the top 25, Google High Bandwidth is the number one site visited by our users. If you add the next 24 together, they don't equal the bandwidth of number one. Uh, data point. Bandwidth hog, a lot of utilization, but also a lot of capability as we access that. Uh, I, I categorize our problems and issues into the, what I call the three C's, culture, conduct, and capability. Capability primarily being the technological piece of it, the stuff we have to buy. The culture is changing service culture to think about this as warfighting capability. 
not simply communications or intelligence support to warfighting capability. It is a warfare area in the Navy now and considered to be a warfighting domain. That cultural change has begun to happen. Understanding accountability for these things, just like we understand accountability for anything else. If there's an engineering failure on a platform, the CO is accountable. If there's a vulnerability in the network that can be prevent, prevented, the CO is accountable. These are common applications and Navy models that work across all warfare areas, this being one of them. We have to think in the Navy about this like we think about damage control and force protection. So if a ship were being taken under small arms fire 60,000 times a day, it would stimulate us. We should be stimulated by the risk to our network and the number of times it's being probed a day as well. The conduct piece of this is simply how our users conduct themselves, what they do that's right, what they do that's wrong, and correcting bad user behavior as we go. And part of that is thinking about this within an operational context that says it has to be driven by an inspection mentality like everything else we do within the service. We expect what we inspect. If we're not inspecting it like we do everything else, frankly, we don't know what to expect. And then finally, in capability, and the primary one that I'll point out there, or two that I'll point out there, are automation. We need more, more, more. Touch labor is very expensive. Uh, the expense in this area is not platform expense. It is, in the, it is in the workforce. And the second piece of this is network situational awareness. We have to have a good common operational picture. Otherwise, we simply do not know what's going on across the networks. And it's an easy thing to talk about, but I started out by describing this as one large enterprise network, uh, one net, which is our overseas piece of this, which is three network enclaves, and then roughly 300 ships at sea, each with roughly different configurations. So the challenge of linking all that together and providing a common operational picture that gives the commander the situational awareness that he or she needs is tremendously challenging. And so a couple of things that are being done right now within the Navy to begin to get our arms around this and ensure those communications to the warfighter that we need. The first is establish an inspection mentality. We have kicked off an inspection program starting last October that I, that I would compare to things like, that we, we all know and understand within the Navy, things like INSERV. So this is a, uh, a 36-month rotation that ultimately will inspect 990 organizations uh, over a 36-month uh, period. It will allow us to understand much better what we have out there, what the problems are, and allow us to, uh, allow us to fix them. I talked to you about the common operating picture that, uh, that we're developing. The last item is we are moving to a distributed uh, network organizational construct, uh, which will establish four regional network operations and security centers, uh, one in Atlantic, one in the Pacific, uh, one in, uh, in CENTCOM in Bahrain, and uh, one in Euro in Naples. The idea here is centralized C2 from the, uh, from the mock at 10th Fleet with distributed global operations where each one of those RNOSCs is co-located with, uh, with a Navy component commander and a numbered fleet commander to help them better, better understand what capability is available to them within their region and, uh, and what we're doing to improve both security and operational capacity on the network. And I will, uh, I will stop at that and thank you very much for, uh, for the time and look forward to your questions. Thanks, Ned. Tim? Yes, sir. Thanks uh, for uh, inviting me to participate in the panel. Uh, I think I'll, I'll give a slightly different uh, perspective as, as, a, as an intel uh, professional uh, on, on, on cyber, and I'm, I'm somewhat uh, uh, schiz schizophrenic on cyber myself. Uh, uh, I have at least three different perspectives that I attack it from just from as an intel officer. So um, much like my... Uh, Army uh, uh, brethren uh, predecessor here, uh, I'm going to start with the why. Uh, and the why is, is the operational, uh, the operator needs, and, and, much, uh, and I'm also going to use the same uh, comment uh, from General McChrystal about uh, in order to defeat a network, you need to be a network. And uh, I agree, when he was talking about a network, he was, the physical structure of the network was only part of that. Uh, in fact, it was a, 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 a smaller component. He, the, he's talking about what that network provides, the shared situation awareness, the comms connectivity, which is really what you think of it, the infrastructure is, is a component, obviously. Uh, that network gives you shared purpose. Uh, cultural proximity, and this is kind of important because having been in many fusion centers, 
uh, joint fusion centers where we're tethered to our stovepipe uh, systems, uh, it looks like we have cultural proximity because we're sitting next to each other, but when we have different systems that are feeding us and you have the younger generation that can become very focused on their appliance, uh, even though they're sitting next to each other, they're not, they're not in cultural proximity because they're not in the same data. Uh, so that network can't simply be co-location of networks. It has to be the interface of the network at the user level. Uh, establish C2 unity of effort. Uh, and the last two kind of conflict, or you might think they conflict. There's unity of effort and support to decentralized operation, which is, is part of the challenge that, that we face here. Uh, but what he, was, what he was getting at is uh, this network, this, this uh, in cyber, uh, cyber warfare, uh, uh, cyber domain, we've got to bring everybody together. Everybody who can contribute has to be brought into the fold. So another picture, probably not as, as visual as, as the one that was painted earlier, uh, there's a spectrum of information requirements that we've progressed through pretty rapidly. Um, when we were found ourselves in maneuver warfare and, and we were uh, fighting a joint battle, we really were de deconflicting. We were sharing the minimum amount of information necessary to deconflict our battle space, and we could get away with that in, in maneuver warfare. Uh, then as, as we moved from maneuver warfare and we found ourselves more in population-centric, uh, deconfliction wasn't enough. Uh, you had to have more shared situation awareness, and we brought systems together. Uh, then, then kind of the next level up is cooperation. We, we realized that, that just having the people together wasn't enough. You had, have to have cooperation. And, and really now we're talking about, uh, in General McChrystal's view, it's cohesion of the network and the information and how it feeds information to the people that, that are, are in that network. The challenge with that is that um, the, the information demand as you move from deconfliction to cohesion is, tr is a tremendous increase. Just in sensor, uh, if I just look at sensors uh, in this 10-year this period, uh, we move from requirements that are in terabytes to systems that, that are emerging that are, are putting exabytes of data on, on the backbone and we, we want access to that. Uh, and that's just the sensor. And on top of that, there's this additional need to exchange that information. So uh, a pretty striking uh, evolution of, of operator requirements, and, and Intel and, and Signal find themselves at the epicenter of the operational requirements when it comes to net-centric warfare, cyber warfare, um, this whole discussion, because we're trying to bring together the people who can, the, the sensors, the people who decide, and the people who act, and, the, and the, the, our, our cyber domain has to do that for us. Uh, that, and uh, in that same article that General McChrystal writes, he talks about blinks, and what a blink is, is the friction points in our system that prevent us from seeing the picture. So every time we have a friction point, we close our eyes to the information that's in front of us, and we miss something, and a commander is acting on information that was available, but he didn't see. Those blinks uh, cost us, uh, they, they cost us lives and, and we've got to, our, our operations have to focus on how we reduce the, the, the blinks. So where I work right now as, a, as a, an integration, uh, technology integration effort, uh, I'm trying to solve some of those problems from the Intel perspective. So a lot of what I'm doing is providing tools that allow analysts to deal with this, this massive increase in technology uh, and have a system that can adapt as the commander's uh, sensors and as his needs uh, change. And, and largely we're focused on cloud technology. That in and of itself is a pretty uh, vague uh, term. 
but we're, from my perspective, we're looking at cloud technology for the flexibility that it provides, the power that it provides and gives us to uh, handle the data that, that, we, that our, our operators, our analysts expect to see, uh, and it gives us the flexibility to adapt. Uh, and, and people, some may argue with me, but as we do it right, uh, if we do it right, we have to do it right, it also gives us more security because we, uh, as stated earlier, we reduce the attack surface by having more, more services from the cloud and less on the edge. So I'm gonna wrap this up by just uh, pointing out some of the, uh, the challenges uh, that we have to, have to solve uh, or some of the challenges as we take this on. One is, is maintaining, the, uh, uh, maintaining consensus, momentum, uh, what I call a coalition of the willing, the people who are moving out into uh, uh, particularly in the area I'm operating, cloud computing, and they're not scared by the technology, but they recognize it's probably an inevitable wave that is passing through us, and we need to grasp it, and we need to understand the risk and, and uh, handle those, those risks. Uh, part of the challenge I see is as we take that on, there are a lot of flavors of cloud, probably a lot out in the room today, a lot of private clouds, um, and, and we will be operating on, obviously on a private cloud, but uh, we need to have uh, those, those private clouds are offered in an open architecture, a non-proprietary open architecture that allows us to leverage the entire, uh, the entire commercial market. And then finally, um, I think it was already mentioned, some of the, there, there are some, some sticky problems that we we're working on, but we have to solve the identity-based access control we have to know who's coming into our network. We have to overcome the challenge of policy trailing technology. So um, we have to understand that's a friction point uh, and, and aggressively attack it, but not stop because the policy doesn't last. The policy wasn't designed to deal with the technologies that we're seeing today. And, and then uh, finally, from my perspective, we have to embrace the, the need to share versus uh, the need to know, uh, and that's kind of odd to hear from an intel guy, but I'm a tactical operational intel guy, so I have a different perspective. With that, sir, I'll... Uh, Thank you, Tim. Nancy? Okay. Well, I was introduced as having the industry perspective, but I don't think that's really true because I really, um, the only thing I've been doing the last year and a half is building a log home. And so I don't think we want to talk about log home industry today. Uh, so I am going to try and give some personal observations um, about cyber um, based on my experience when I was on the joint staff and working these issues and some of the things that I've seen happen since uh, I've retired. And um, I think if any of you were here yesterday morning, and got to hear General Schmittel, um, he had some pretty interesting things to say, and I think some pretty progressive things um, that a lot of people have been saying for a long time but really hadn't caught on at his level. And so to hear a Marine um, talking, even though he did have pretty pictures, uh, like a Marine should, um, about describing cyber, in war fighting terms. And I think that's one of the important things that we've really made the leap from cyber being an, a six uh, black box techie thing to being a war fighting domain. It's a global domain. I think we all agree on that. It's a joint domain. And I don't think that we've yet made the leap to understanding what it is as a joint domain, because we still have an Army network, we still have a Navy network. Uh, unfortunately, we have more than one Navy network. We have more than one Army network. In fact, neither one of them can probably tell me how many networks there are, even though both services, all the services, have made significant progress in getting their arms around how many networks are really out there. 
Um, but as long as we have this inability to see and understand what the connections are, we can never really operate or deliver anything to the warfighter that would be considered assured because there are things going on that we have no control over that we don't have an understanding of. And to try and think that we have a dot mill domain that we can build a, 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 some kind of security or perimeter around that makes us secure, that's not true. As long as we have one connection to the internet, which we have to have in order to operate. So we have to figure out not how to build a perimeter, but how to break down the perimeters and yet operate securely. And I think we also have to realize that uh, because we are charged with being responsible for just the dot mill, that we can't be satisfied with that. If we can't um, see and work with the other agencies, the .gov, the .com, and try and get standards and security throughout the entire internet, then we're all vulnerable. And so I don't think you can continue to talk about cyber the way we talk about other warfighting domains. It's not the same. And so we try and put it in this box where we use the terminology that we use in other warfighting domains, but it really doesn't fit. We have to we have to start thinking about cyber as a completely different environment. You can't geographically divide it. You can't say, okay, because this is in PACOM's AOR, that PACOM is the only one that has any control over it. Because anybody in the world could be accessing it Everybody needs to understand the vulnerability that's associated with it because someone in the Atlantic is just as vulnerable by that box or that circuit as someone in the Pacific. So we have to change the way we think about cyber and we have to change the way we define tactics and techniques and procedures because we can't just draw from the other warfighting domains and skill sets because cyber is very, very different. And if we can't make that leap, then we're never going to be as secure or as capable in the cyber domain as we are in the other domains. And so I think, you know, we've made a lot of progress with heading toward enterprise solutions uh, with identity management, uh, we're much farther ahead in a lot of areas than we were when, when I uh, retired a year and a half ago. And we've gotten to the point now where people realize that this is the instrument we need to all have and be able to operate with. That you can't have a secure sleeve that makes this weigh 500 pounds um, you have to have something that you can use on the go and still have access to everything you need to operate. So you have to be wireless, you have to be user friendly, you have to be global, I have to be able to use it and get my information regardless of where I am. Uh, now the problem is, is how do we understand the risks associated with that and how do we mitigate them? Not that we take these things away from folks, but that we give them out in larger numbers and not increase our, our risks beyond how, what we can mitigate and understand. So that's kind of the perspective that I have uh, and uh, would look forward to 
questions, and I would also add one other thing that I hope will get some questions, is that I believe cyber needs to be funded centrally. That you can't have the services funding their own pieces of it because you can never be achieve the same standard across the board because they're all going to fund different things at a different level. And the lowest denominator is the weakest link and that's going to and we're all going to suffer from that. So unless you have a standard flow of funds from a central point that architects and designs and uh, operates, I don't think that you're going to be able to realize the capabilities that cyber actually um, ha has um, for the warfighter. So I'd take the Navy and the Army's money away from them. <laughs> <laughs> and let the Air Force keep theirs? Yeah, well, I don't think the Air Force has any money left. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Uh, all right. Well, look, uh, I've got a couple questions here. I'm going to get this started. I hope uh, if we have some questions in the audience, you would just kind of walk up to the mic because, like I said, these are, these are quick answers. They will be on the timer. Uh, it's kind of what we call a lightning round here. And I'm going to start out the first question here uh, talking to General Brendler. Um, so there was already discussion here by Admiral Dietz about the uh, uh, expansion and, and need, if you will, for more data. Uh, he, he was talking about getting into exabytes and so forth. And uh, given all the, what is happening today in the commercial sector, in many cases, folks are demanding on our iPhone like 30 gigabytes uh, a day. As organizations begin to look towards more of this use of commercial capability, uh, and in many cases I'm talking about Facebook and Twitter to kind of do operational aspects here, what do you think this is going to do besides just doubling capacity to allow to make sure that there's the infrastructure such that you can support the warfighter? Well, the first part, sir, is um, the diversity and capacity that I was referring to before um, does pertain to the going beyond doubling the capacity. We do palm for the anticipated increase in demand following the uh, continuous trend line from prior years. Um, in that sense, this is an agnostic ability to support um, increasing demand. Uh, I know you're specifically talking about the social networking capabilities. And the other thing that I would um, add there in that is DOD in general is much more hardened now than it was in 2008 when the policy came out of DOD that said, we allow, you, you will allow responsible use of internet-based capabilities despite the threat that they might represent uh, because of the benefits that we could get out of it. So the things that we've done since then and will continue to do on the hardening side are of advantage to us there. Okay. Um, Ned, um, you already talked about the need for human interaction, the type of thing that takes place with respect to uh, this whole thing about culture, and, and, and basically it's all back to the human. Uh, a recent uh, cybersecurity study, this was the one bun, done by the Commission on Cybersecurity in November 2010, entitled A Human Capital Crisis in Cybersecurity. As suggested by the report and recent comments by a lot of senior leaders in DOD, uh, the forecast for cyber experts is showing a widening gap between demand and supply. What do you think steps can, uh, what, what do you think DOD can do, specifically even the Navy, what the Navy the Navy's doing, to in many cases look to close this gap in terms of the need for experts in the human dimension? Yeah, great. Okay, thanks. That's an easy one, Jeff. Huh? Good. Um, I, so uh, Nancy hit on something. Nancy hit on risk calculation, and you know, I, I think one of the things that's very difficult for us in this area is is we don't know how to calculate the risk, and so it becomes very difficult to mitigate and very difficult to decide how much we're going to take. We're really good at it when it comes to launching F-18s and sending tanks out into the desert and all. We've gotten good at that part. Um, but in this area, it's really hard. We simply know where the beast lives. We know that it could bite us, but how frequently will it? And when it does, what sort of damage does it cause? One of the, uh, to me, one of the greatest risk factors that we face is the human capital piece of this thing, that, uh, that the lack of the numbers of trained personnel that we need today and into the future is, uh, it is 
Uh, well, it depends on which figure you use, but I think one of the projections is we'll have about 22% of what we need in about another seven or eight years. Yeah. Um, a, a, a couple of thoughts. First, automation begins to solve part of that problem because today we're very, very labor intensive in, in how we apply all of this capability. So far as things that we can do, first of all, we're, we're all competing for the same pool, which makes it really challenging, whether it's industry or, uh, or .edu or the military or .gov. We're, we're all looking at the same pool, and that's everything from uh, people with advanced degrees graduating from college and graduate school, or whether it's just the kid off the street that happens to be very, very good intuitively at this. Uh, we don't assess that well, and I think that's something that we have to be able to do, both within our force and, and, uh, and within the force writ large that we would recruit from. The things I see, uh, certifications, uh, degree opportunities, advanced degrees, it's not about the pay most of the time, it's about the work. Uh, when we get kids into this business, they are thrilled by it. However, the, the, uh, the uh, continuation and, uh, and the retention piece beyond recruitment becomes a challenge over the long haul, I think. But I do believe that there are a number of things, substantive things that have nothing to do with money that we can do today. And the work that we provide to that workforce is something that they simply cannot do anyplace else. Could I add just to um, build on that? Because I think the, the training and education piece is greater than just for the cyber professional. And I think it's, it's a piece that none of us have paid any attention to, or at least really not enough attention to. There have been, uh, the Army did a really great thing with the general officers, taking them um, into a classroom and showing them the vulnerabilities. Uh, but really, cyber, the threat to our networks is an insider threat. And it's not because somebody's trying to be malicious, it's because they don't know. They don't understand uh, what the security issues are surrounding a password or why your password shouldn't be password. They don't understand why putting your password on a yellow sticky under your keyboard is, is a bad thing. You know, and it's and it's and that's a little bit um, light. I mean, I think we're beyond probably that understanding level. But there are a lot of things that people don't understand. And when I was out at Northcom, you know, we made a report. My folks reported to me every morning about where we were with our patches and you know how secure our network was. And well, we were a hundred percent on patches. Well, I, I thought we were, that was good. Well, I found out we were 100% installed, but they, the operator, the N3 would never let them turn off the machine to reboot it. So of course a patch was there, but it wasn't doing any good. <laughs> so, you know, you have to under, I had to explain to them why we had to take downtime. Because we had to make sure the network was secure and patched. They had no clue. They just saw that as impacting on them not being able to, to have the network for two seconds, you know. So we really have an education and a training issue for the entire force, the entire workforce. And it needs to be built into every class and everything we do every day, just like other items are. I mean, we don't give anyone a firearm unless they're properly trained. We have strict rules on how they use it, when they can load it, where you can discharge it, all of those things. But we give everybody a computer and access to our network. Okay. So. Thank you. Ray? Thank you, General Sorensen, and thanks to the panel for addressing this, uh, I think, a really critical issue. So what I wanted to do is pose a, a perhaps a pro provocative uh, hypothesis and, and get the panel to uh, comment on it. And the hypothesis is this. Um, I have a general sense that uh, against the most sophisticated uh, threats, and, and that's a growing thing, a changing thing, that our efforts at defense um, fall short. And in fact, maybe perhaps the, the gap, even as we make progress in defense, uh, the distance we have to go grows. Um, as the threat evolves. And so I, I was wondering what the panel thought about whether that's a, a true or false hypothesis. And if it's true, um, how do we change this equation? Thank you. Okay. 
So now I'm going to give you an opportunity since you uh, do this for the Navy. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, well, uh, I'm afraid that perhaps your hypothesis is right. I think we have to assume your hypothesis is right because if we not if we don't, then uh, then we're truly on dangerous ground. Um, to me, the to me the key is the concept of dynamic defense. I so as as most of you know today, still for the most part, we uh, we defend at the firewall. And the simple concept of, uh, of, our, of our military is completely counter to that, that the idea is to find the enemy and keep the enemy as far away as we possibly can. Having the enemy knocking on your door on a regular basis doesn't make any of us feel comfortable. So I really think that, uh, that one of the keys in, if, if there is a gap here, and I, I do believe there is, there's, there's a serious gap that needs to be closed. Uh, if we can't get ourselves regularly beyond the firewall, become predictive, become interdictive, um, and proactive, uh, then we, in fact, won't defeat the threat. So, yeah. Okay. Sir. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, information on the panel. Antoine Ford from Enlightened Incorporated. Uh, you mentioned something earlier that uh, I'd like to get your perspective on the cloud. Both from the DOD and the civilian agencies, there's been some inconsistency on what applications should go in the cloud, what are the standards. Um, how do you secure applications in the cloud? I'm interested in how you believe that some of the DOD agencies are going to get consistent and what direction will uh, come from that. Uh, the, uh, the, the government, or the U.S. government, is, is wrestling with this right now. In fact, uh, uh, the cloud is one of the top 25 initiatives of the, of the uh, CIO uh, of the government. Uh, and, and the IC has, has a significant uh, cloud initiative, as does DOD. Fortunately, they're all wrestling with it at the same time, and they have all, uh, DOD and the IC are uh, working very closely together to establish uh, the, the way forward, the reference architecture, if you will. Uh, the government, uh, the, the government uh, body right now is more focused on cloud as it's being used in the commercial sector, but that dialogue is occurring. So how, how the government gets involved in private clouds and how we leverage across the government, uh, the dialogue is occurring. It's, it, it's at its nascent stage uh, because with this technology, frankly, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what those standards are, and, and as a technologist who's applying it right now, I, I amaze myself every day with how little I know about what the standards sh should be. I start with a standard, uh, but I don't know that that's right, so we have to caution ourselves not to lock in prematurely on something just because it was the first standard we found, or we'll find ourselves uh, Hand, handcuffing ourselves to the technology. So that, that challenge, that, that reference architecture discussion is, is occurring. Uh, the good news is it is a collaborative effort between U.S. government, the, uh, a actually the international partners, uh, DOD and the IC. Thank you. Joe, I'm gonna give you, you, you wanna make any comment? If not, uh, gonna, we got another question. The, um, on the cloud, the other thing that I was going to say is, while it's a useful metaphor in that it, it, it's a visual, I mean, you, you can actually draw one on a paper when you don't want to show all the complexity of what's inside it and connect lines to it so that you create that abstraction. Um, and, and it's very useful in that sense. But in so doing, you've also hidden what's inside it. Now, that's, it's ironic in the sense that what we actually want to create is a transparent end and capability that makes it as if it's not there, you can see right through it. So the, the fact that the visual cloud, if you see one up in the sky, is actually something opaque you cannot see through is exactly the opposite of the effect that you want to achieve in, in presenting a cloud. There are multiple standards and they serve multiple purposes. I don't think it would be beneficial to DOD to limit itself to um, a selection of just one type of cloud technology. There are some that serve um, uh, high-speed computing applications better than others. Uh, there are some that serve uh, specific niche application 
capabilities that need to run in one subset of our geographic locations better than others. We call that in this a, a capacity services offering that we have. Um, the uh, Amazon EC3 type capability based on um, Hadoop and a distributed file system and the MapReduce capability to make it look like that whole cloud is just one big computer is a completely different approach which may be more valuable to some other applications. Uh, so I, I don't think we should go too far in trying to pr pick a particular one yet. Right. Okay. Sir. Yes, Colonel Stewart Dickey. I'd like to ask the panel as we create this uh, new warfare domain um, to draw some similarities to when we created a type of operations now known as information operations. And that was taking various like disciplines and putting them under one sort of centralized approach. And quite frankly, the jury's still out on that. And it is certainly applied differently depending on what service you're in and, and, and what uh, area you're in inside that service. Uh, do you see similar, I guess, pros and cons with the creation of a centralized approach to various like disciplines inside the cyber world? Thank you. Okay, Ned, if you want to sure. comment on that. Um, yeah, I guess since I spoke to that up front, Colonel, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly there will be challenges with it. I, so the Navy created this model under NetWarcom a number of years ago that brought together these information link disciplines under a single warfighting commander. And, uh, and that aspect of it, we liked a great deal. It did not fit a warfighting model, which was the birth of 10th Fleet and FCC. Um, but people talk about sometimes the breadth of the mission areas. So it's cryptologic, it's SIGINT, it's, it's uh, IP networks, it's long haul communications, EW. But, but all linked by information and all linked by what I would call spectrum operations. And I think that the logic behind the relationship there says that this is the way ahead. We, we like this model and absolutely believe that this is achievable and that if we were to spin off parts of this, um, they would not receive the level of attention that they need to receive. And they're so interrelated, you know, back to, back to a failure in this area impacting the, the things that we do in long haul communications, for instance. So yeah, I, I think it is achievable, but there, there are certainly challenges. Okay. Thanks. A observation I'd make is clearly, and I think this was made earlier, there are new TTPs in this domain of warfare that we need to discover. So you don't get there just by simply pulling Signal and the cryptologist together. They, the, the organizational construct, uh, the ability to deal with the authorities, because really the threat doesn't care what our authorities are. Uh, the, our author well, actually, they do. Our authorities uh, are a scene that they can exploit and, and attack because we can't figure out things fast enough. So overcoming the, the authorities issue or developing the TTP, the organizational construct uh, to, to help us fight in this domain, uh, there are things like that will need to evolve in this warfighting domain. So it, it, it's not just bring your intel skills, bring your, your net op skills and you've got, you've got the right team. Okay. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Capella. I just wanted to thank the panel for their contributions, specifically Rear Admiral Dietz with his views on automation to offset human capital disparity, Colonel Hill's approach regarding, uh, you know, the, and Vice Admiral Brown's approach or comments surrounding cultural awareness. Often throughout the panel's discussion, I was thinking back to an article that was written by General Merrose regarding the fact that our cybersecurity strategy can no longer be centered around intrusion detection due to the ubiquity of information technology. And I agree with the cultural awareness aspect that was brought up by both Vice Admiral Brown and Colonel Hill. My point is, is that it shouldn't just extend to on the job. It also has to extend when, when people go home. I mean, our adversaries will build up consumer preference files on people. And if they can't get into where they are, well, they'll find out what they like at home, and then they send them, you know, like phishing emails. And so when that person clicks on that email, let's say their wife likes a particular brand of shoe or something, right? Clicks on that email, gets around all the intrusion detection, and now all of a sudden they've penetrated our network. Indeed, a personal example of that would be when I went to a Direct Energy Professional Society conference that deals with DE weaponry. And I was talking to them, and they checked everybody's cat card, right, on the door, and I asked them, how many people took the batteries out of their cell phone? 
and to which that person's blood drained from their face. So my point is, is that I agree with you on the idea of fostering this cultural awareness that na that kind of cybersecurity is everybody's business. I would actually submit we could learn some things from the Israelis regarding how they view national security. My point is, how effective do you see us instilling that kind of awareness throughout our entire armed forces and, and intelligence personnel? Because I like, find that woefully lacking. So, Ned, since you've got 750,000 people that you're trying to deal with, <laughs> why, don't, uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you take a whack at this one? Sure. Yeah, that, so that's a great point. I, uh, I go up and I talk to the command leadership school every month. Uh, so all of, our, all of our new COs and XOs go, go through this. And, and it, it's all about a lot of different things, but a good chunk of what it's about is accountability. And because of some of the ugly lessons that we've learned aboard ships and at our shore sites, a portion of it is, my entire portion, is to make them aware of what exists in the command that they're going to be accountable for and, and what they really need to know about it. And of course, they get that. I mean, they, they understand accountability is absolute. But what the very first class said to me was, hey, sure, we get it. Uh, we don't understand it, but we get it. Um, we weren't trained in it. So these are, in most cases, senior men and women, uh, 0506, who say we have been steeped in naval warfighting, in engineering plan operation, in hull tech, in weapon systems, and yet IP-based networks were dropped in our lap, you know, mid-career. Uh, we've not been back to school for it. Uh, you know, our seamen aren't getting it in the, in the basics. Um, so, so I think it's a great point. It's also one that we've acknowledged is critical for us to fix, and we're in the process of working that into the curricula from, from seaman to admiral. Somebody said, what happens when you close the gap? So today there's a huge gap between the digital natives that are growing up in this business and the, and the digital immigrants, or as somebody called me, a digital transplant. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that gap always, will always exist in this area. Um, today, it's a difference between me and my Xbox generation sons, but when my son's sitting in my seat up here, the young kid is going to be using a completely different device that's only related by ones and zeros. So as fast as the technology changes, so changes that gap, I think the training has to continue forever. You can't get away from it. And you certainly can't make the assumption that a digitally savvy force necessarily understands risk, vulnerability, because our youngsters coming in don't understand all of that either. They can operate it. Uh, right. Protecting it and securing it is a completely different pace. Right. Okay, we're up to our time limit here, uh, but I just got one more question for the panel. This is very quick. And I want each one of you to take just about 30 seconds, because this is just one thing you can ask for. Uh, but if you can only, and, and this is really for the industry people here, you pay a lot of money to come to these things. And so I uh, want to give you an opportunity to kind of get an answer from them. And the question I posed to all of them preceding the attendance here was, if you could only ask industry for one thing, what from your personal and organizational perspective is the one thing you would ask from industry? So each one's got about 30 seconds, quickly. Sir, it would be working the ABAC, the attribute-based access control. I mentioned it before. There are both policy and technical challenges there. Uh, that need to be worked, and I think industry could help us out on both sides of that. Okay, Ned? Yeah, okay, so it would, be, uh, it would be the common operational picture and situational awareness that showed us everything from uh, prediction of a, of a next attack to the operational impact of some failure on the network. Okay, Tim? Sir, I, I agree with, uh, with DISA on, on ABAC, so I'm going to take an alibi on this. Uh, that was my specific. Uh, the more general, I, I would ask industry to bring uh, solutions to us that fit into open standards, open architecture, vice, proprietary, because that causes so much challenge in, in bringing the network together. Okay. And Nancy, from your log home? <laughs> from my log home, I'd like two things. And that is, how do we really do risk analysis um, on the network, and, and how do we do cost-benefit analysis so we understand the next dollar we spend, what are we really achieving with that dollar, instead of saying, well, we need to buy these many boxes to defend our network, how much safer is our network by spending that much money, and is that the best way to spend that money? Okay. 
And with that, I just want to close and sort of thank the panel for their contributions today, as well as what they do every day uh, to ensure that the communications, that part of cyber, is secure and available and reliable, as well as from a security perspective, making sure that uh, in many cases they're thwarting the enemy, and that enemy could be anything from just the, the little hacker to, in many cases, nation states, or in many cases, I would say, terrorist organizations or whatever trying to attack that network. And the intel and analysis that gets done by our military intelligence community to make sure that we know what those actors are in order to preclude their opportunity to, if you will, come in and attack that network. So just want to thank the panel for what they do and for what they do every day. Well, General Sorensen and panelists, uh, thank you very much on behalf of FCA and the United States Naval Institute. I would, I would just say one thing, the, the, the comment that we don't know what we don't know um, certainly holds true here in, in cyber as well as in a lot of other things, but the, the thing that most strikes me is the passion from these individuals at the table and the fact that you have uh, uniformed workers who then become uh, civilians and keep that same passion and work those same issues and talk to industry and work with us and the Institute in trying to build that dialogue to solve the solutions. So thank you for that and thank you for being here today.